Welcome back, everybody. Are there any questions? Going. Yeah, where is everyone? <laughs> everyone's online and everyone's in the future because they'll be watching this hours after I say the words. They're watching on the vision. Yeah. <laughs> I I posted the new homework, so uh, have a look at that. There's uh, you know, various paths you can take in doing the homework. And there's uh, ways to get bonus points. And a, a big way to get bonus points will be as if you type the solutions in LaTeX. I'll offer bonus points again. Um, much, well, some people write so neatly, I can't say it's much easier to read. Uh, but for the most part, it usually is. So bonus points if you can write in LaTeX. And uh, there are four problems and um, some... Uh, extra challenges here and there and uh, some of them you can do sort of halfway and some you can do all the way to get uh, extra credit have a look at those and let me know what you think but uh, today we're going to stick with uh, what we're working through now and that's uh, matched asymptotic analysis uh, only I think uh, well actually three out of the four problems are on matched asymptotic analysis I believe uh, if I'm not mistaken. So a lot of the information that you'll need to solve a couple of later problems are going to be covered today in the next lecture. Like, for example, how do I locate, how do I know where a boundary layer is? So we haven't really talked about that. All of our examples up to this point have had boundary layers which were located only at the left-hand side of the interval of interest, the domain. So now we want to kind of... Uh, make this um, more concrete. Suppose that epsilon is a small number, a and b are real numbers, x is smaller than x, x naught is smaller than x2, so we're working on a finite interval with that property. Assume that p is a c1 function and q is a c0 function. And uh, C1 and C0 over the entire domain of interest X0 to X2, including the endpoints. Suppose that P, when I expand around any point, zeta, so I'm thinking about uh, alpha being a small number and alpha being or going to zero as epsilon goes to zero, then P of zeta plus alpha should be equal to P of zeta plus an order one quantity, meaning this is a term that goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero ultimately. Same with Q. Q of zeta plus alpha should be equal to Q of zeta uh, plus an order one term, a term which becomes small as epsilon goes to zero. And this should hold for any zeta in X naught to X two. Zeta is going to represent for us a possible location for the boundary layer. So basically I'm saying at the boundary, at any boundary layer point, if I expand around the boundary layer point, I have boundary layer data, or I have the function of evaluated at the boundary layer point plus small stuff. Okay. So basically this is kind of a continuity statement. Okay. Suppose that uh, P is everywhere greater than zero. Okay, on the whole of the interval. Let Y be our true solution to the problem. In fact, we know that it's, we know by a theorem now that a solution it, it exists and is unique as long as epsilon is sufficiently small. Okay, so this piece of information combined with epsilon being sufficiently small means that we're going to have a solution. Uh, all, at all times, okay? All right, now, um, equation 21 and 22, or sorry, 20 and 21, that was just the general uh, ODE that we're interested in. So let me write it out for you again. So it's epsilon y double prime plus p times y prime plus q times y equals zero 
and y of zero equals, sorry, it's uh, a generic interval now, y of x zero equals a, and y of x two equals b. All right, so that's our system that we're looking at. That's the problem. And I think uh, this was 20 and this is 21, if I'm not mistaken. So we have a solution guaranteed to this, but uh, we know that epsilon is going to be small. So we want to know where the boundary layer is going to be located. Well, the theorem tells us there's a boundary layer of thickness delta equals epsilon located at x equals x naught. So this tells us that we have a boundary layer at x naught always. And the only thing that we require to know this information is that p is a positive function. Okay, it's positive on the whole interval. If we have that, then uh, we know that the boundary layer is going to be located at x naught and it's going to have thickness epsilon. Okay, this is what we're going to prove. Furthermore, a composite uniformly valid approximation of the true solution is given by an inner solution, sorry, outer solution plus an inner solution uh, minus C1, where C1 is the common value or is the, is the value we get from matching. The nice thing is we can nail down exactly what the outer solution should be. It's going to be B exponential integral from X to X2 q over p dt. Now notice that this is a function of x because the lower bound is an undetermined value x. And if you put in x1, you can, well, there, we'll get there and we'll get there momentarily. Certainly if I put in x2, then uh, this is just going to be zero, exponential of zero, this is b. Okay, so you can see why that this is, uh, equal to uh, automatically satisfies the boundary condition at the right-hand endpoint. For the inner solution, we have in the stretched variable Z, you don't have to know that this is the stretched variable Z, but uh, that's what it is. Y zero, the leading order um, inner approximation in the stretched variable Z is equal to C1, an unknown constant, which we're gonna make known momentarily plus a minus c1 exponential of minus p of x naught. p of x naught is, is positive, right? Because we're assuming that p is positive on the whole interval. So this is minus a positive number. So that's a negative number there times z. And then the unknown constant, which also is our matching term, turns out to be c1 which is B exp exponential integral from x naught to x2. Notice that now this is a definite integral, right? It's uh, has a value, it's not variable, and uh, of Q over P. And the max of uh, x between x naught and x2, including the endpoints, difference in absolute value of the true solution minus the composite solution. This is the Z, this is our standard zero, zero composite solution is a big O of epsilon. So in other words, it's less than a constant times epsilon as epsilon gets smaller and smaller. Okay, so this is what we want to prove. In fact, I'm gonna be completely honest. Um, I don't have a good proof for this one yet. So I just let that, let it, I left it off. And so I cited a book, uh, a reference for this uh, part of the proof. Everything else we're going to try to prove. Well, this particular theorem, we talk about that particular um, differential operator. Um, yeah, so the differential operator, let me remind you, is epsilon y double prime plus p x y prime of x plus q of x y of x so that's the differential operator that we're using the right hand side f is homogeneous zero and the boundary conditions are generic they're the the left boundary condition is a dirichlet boundary condition 
y of x naught equals a, and the right boundary condition is y of x2 equals b. So that's the problem we're solving. So I think I, yeah, this is uh, non-zero. So we can handle problems where the right-hand side is, um, yeah, sorry, it's zero, but we can handle problems where the right-hand side is non-zero as well. It just takes a little bit of extra writing. All right, so let's uh, go through the proof here. And again, um, this is this is uh, this theorem is telling us something very important: where the boundary, uh, where the boundary layer is located, and what conditions tell us when we can expect to have the boundary layer located at that point. So let's let Z, we don't know yet that the boundary conditions at the left-hand endpoint, we want to prove that. So let Zeta be a point in X naught to X2 that denotes the location of the boundary layer. Inside the boundary layer, as usual, we're going to define a stretched variable. And the stretch variable is defined like this for Zeta being variable. X minus uh, Zeta over Delta. Or we can solve for x and write x equals zeta plus delta times z. Delta is a function of epsilon, and it goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So we do as usual. We rewrite the differential equation in terms of the stretched variable. And if we do that, we have this form. Okay, so remember, we have non-constant coefficients now. P and Q. So we have to write those guys as well in terms of the uh, stretched variable. So we're doing the stretch for the inner problem first. We usually do the outer problem first, but it doesn't really matter. Now, our new inner expansion variable, or our new inner variable, is what we usually label as capital Y. And Z here can be a number that is both positive and negative, okay? So Z is equal to zero exactly whenever X is equal to the value of the location of the boundary layer, okay? So if the boundary layer is right in the middle of the domain, then we can go to the left or the right of the boundary layer. And so Z can be both, ne can be not simultaneously, but Z can be negative or positive, right? Or zero. Okay, so now what we want to do is uh, equate orders of coefficients. And so here are the coefficients that we need to equate. So here's where we here's where it comes into play. What is the asymptotic expansion of this and this? So remember, as epsilon gets small, delta gets small, and z is just an order one number. So this becomes small, or based on our assumptions, the the difference between this and this is just an order one term, something which gets small. So in terms of our asymptotic or our, um, yeah, our, our asymptotic order, then what we're doing is we're equating this to not, not this, but some asymptotic expansion of it that doesn't involve this term. And so what we get is this term here, okay? You think P of C is getting small? I thought, should it be like constant? Which one? You say P of... Uh, no, this term delta Z is getting small oh, yeah. because delta goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. But Z is order one. And uh, zeta is some fixed number. We're just going to fix it in the, in the domain. Okay? So in terms of uh, asymptotic expansions, we want this to match this or this to match this, right? We do the dominant balance as usual. So dominant balance is achieved by balancing terms one and two, which then dominate terms three, as you can easily check. Um, what we need to do then is take delta equal to epsilon over P of, of zeta, okay? But actually, we don't need this much, this level of fidelity, because P of zeta is just some order one number. So really, all we need is to take delta equals to epsilon to get the dominant balance. Okay, we don't need the, we don't need the constant as well. So no matter where I shift that zeta in the domain, 
P of zeta is going to be an order one number. Okay. All right. Um, so again, we only need to take delta equals epsilon to get the um, asymptotic uh, balance that we're looking for. So in that case, terms one and two balance, and they dominate term three, as you can check. All right, so now um, we're going to assume that we have an inner uh, solution, which is labeled Y, capital YN. And uh, we're going to assume that it has an asymptotic expansion. Um, and we only need it to have an asymptotic expansion of leading order, because we're only going to get a leading order expansion in the whole thing. So we don't need a full series. We don't need to say that it's asymptotics to its full series. We only need to say that it's equal to some term why not, which is the leading order plus an order one term, order one correction, I guess. Or the difference being little o of one. So again, as we, if we say some, if we make an asymptotic statement like this, we need to know in what limit sense, right? But we always mean as epsilon goes to zero. Likewise, we're gonna assume that the different, that the first derivative is also asymptotic and um, to something. And so we're going to assume actually that it's asymptotic to uh, the term by term derivative of this guy. So in other words, the asymptotic expansion of that just involves the deri first derivative of that. And the same with the second derivative, the expansion, just the leading order actually, is just y zero double prime as epsilon goes to zero, as epsilon goes to zero. So now um, we can plug into the uh, the problem, and I guess I didn't rewrite it here. But once we uh, once we establish that delta is equal to epsilon, so what you're going to do is come back here and establish the inner problem. So what should that be? Well, it would be uh, one over epsilon in this term because it's epsilon over epsilon squared. Then we have an epsilon here. We have no epsilon here. Right. So what we're going to do is clear epsilons by multiplying through by epsilon. So basically, we lose this term. There's no term here, and we have an epsilon in front of that guy. So that's where we get this order or the leading order problem from. Okay. So our leading order problem uh, involves a second derivative. The one involving an epsilon, which is the the dominated term, falls away. So that's the last term, and so we're left with this. Now, um, remember, we can expand P, and we do expand P around the location of the of the um, of the boundary layer, which is at zeta. And so that's why we only keep this term. Okay, So if I do that expansion, now you can think about expanding P to all words. For example, if P was an analytic function, then its uh, power series representation is also its it's uh, asymptotic series representation, okay? So if you need more terms, just assume more about P. But in any case, the leading order term is just gonna be P zeta, P evaluated as zeta. So this is the problem we have to solve. Okay, questions about that? I, 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 it may be just a representation thing. Is there, is there a particular reason that whenever you try to write an asymptotic expansion, you have a leading term plus small o of one instead of big o of epsilon. No, yeah, you could use uh, big O of epsilon, um, but uh, if if we say epsilon, then that fixes a scale that we don't have to actually fix because it could be uh, o of ep epsilon to the one half, for example. Okay. Yeah. So this one is a little more vague about it. Yeah. Okay. So the leading order uh, problem is that, and it has this solution. Okay, so C1 plus C2 uh, e to the minus P zeta times Z. All right, now here's the thing about, here's the general rule about uh, boundary layer theory that we haven't really discussed yet. We need to go through. So P of zeta is greater than zero. That's a bedrock fact that we know from our assumption that P is an everywhere positive function. So this means that this solution decays exponentially 
because this is a positive number for z positive. As z gets larger and larger, this decays more and more, right? It decays towards some value. Why? Because this is this is uh, an overall negative number. So as z gets larger and larger, this term decays away. That's actually what we want to experience as we go from the um, the origin of the boundary layer, which is z equals zero, through the boundary layer. So if the boundary layer is located in the middle, let's say it's some zeta, then basically it's decaying on this side exponentially, and it's growing on this side exponentially. So which one we want, um, which one do we want? We want the decay only. So we don't want um, in the boundary layer, we don't want asymptotic growth. We only want asymptotic decay. That's again and again what we experienced with all of our previous solutions. Okay, we want to reject the side that which is growing. Okay, so the inner solution must decay as z increases through the boundary layer, or um, absolute value of z through the boundary layer. The only possibility then, since p is positive, is that zeta is equal to x0. Because if we locate the boundary layer somewhere in the middle, we're going to have both decay on one side of the boundary layer and growth on the other side. And we can't have growth on, on either side. Now, how could we get a situation where we have decay on both sides? Well, we could have a situation where p is, is, is 0 at the, at, the, at the boundary layer. And in fact, we're going to have examples where that happens. If p has a simple 0 at a point in the domain, then we can have a boundary layer in the middle of the, the domain. But if this is not the case, if p is positive, then the only place we can locate the boundary layer is if zeta is at x naught. Zeta has to be equal to x naught because we only can allow the decay through the boundary layer. Basically, as you move away from the, the, the boundary layer location through the boundary, boundary layer, you want decay through the boundary layer, okay? As you move away into the domain. So if we locate it in the center, we move away in this direction, that's going to be z negative. So this is z negative, z less than zero z greater than zero, then we would have asymp or exponential growth, which we have to reject. Okay, so, um, right, yeah. So this is a solution that we have for the... Uh, yeah. Growth. I know, it looks like exponential growth, right? But it's exponential decay for up to... Uh, a positive number. So it looks a bit like this. You have some numbers, let's say C, minus exponential of minus P of oh. squiggle times Z. All right, so it's actually exponentially decaying up to the value C, because right? Oh, yeah. So, so those are the values like the C minus C to the coefficient. Right. So, it, yeah. So we were looking at boundary layers, which look like, as Calvin pointed out, the boundary layers we've looked at all look like that. But it's a misnomer to think that that's the, that's actually exponential growth. It's not. It's actually decay, but from the reverse side. Actually, we could have also looked at boundary layers, which look like this. Okay. So a sharp decrease, and then something like that, like a hook. Um, but we always noticed, or we always observed that our through our boundary layer, we had some action like that. So it's not, the sign here might change. It might be positive in some cases, negative in others. In all of the cases we've had so far, you can go back and check, we've had minus. Okay, so we've had a decay but it's uh, going in this direction, okay, rather than in this direction. Remember, um, yeah, so asymptotic decay 
let's plot an exponential, right? The exponential asymptotic decay usually looks like that, but if we flip the sign, right, then it's actually looking like that. So that's the sense in which we've experienced decay. That's a great question. Is there any um, intrinsic, I, I don't know how to describe that, why, why the inner solution must be decaying? Um, why the inner, inner solution must be decaying rather than blowing up? Um, but even if it blows up, like even if the corner is possible, right? Because we're considering a fine line. Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't be possible. Well, we can't, we wouldn't be able to match it to the outer solution. The outer solution is kind of an order one solution, which is kind of nice, right? So we need to de de the decay so that it matches in an overlap region. If it's constantly, exp if it's constantly just keeps blowing up, blowing up, then, uh, and remember, it can get worse as epsilon gets larger and larger. So we're, we're going to replace this with Z over with we're going to replace the Z with something order one over epsilon. So it's going to keep getting worse. Okay. So we're never going to be able to match such a solution. That's a good question. All right. So we're going to reject having this sort of case. Now, what if P was negative, was everywhere negative? Well, then... If P was everywhere negative, then this would be this would be positive, right? And so we would want the Z to be negative. So that means that we would have decay on this side and growth on that side. And that would tell us that if P is negative, we want our boundary layer to be at X sub two, not X sub one. Okay. And that's going to be the subject of our of the next result. Okay, so again, the only possibility since P of zeta is always positive is that zeta is equal to X naught. We want the decay. And there can be no boundary layer at X equals X sub two or even in the interior. So applying the boundary condition at X equals X naught for the inner solution, now we know immediately that the inner, where the inner solution is located. That's why we did this guy first because the outer solution wouldn't tell us where the boundary layer would be located. So we can now complete the inner expansion up to uh, one of the missing constants or one of the one of the two constants. So we know that uh, when we apply the boundary condition at x equals x naught, that's the one we want, with our leading order solution, which is this guy. Okay, applying it x equals x naught, this is what we get, because x equals x naught is the same as z equals zero. Now that we've located that zeta is equal to x naught, the boundary layer is located at z equals zero, and the boundary condition is at z equals zero. So what we find then is that c2 is equal to a minus c1. So using this, this version, we have to have uh, zero equals a. Okay, so that's what we use, and that implies that y not z is equal to c1. That's still an unknown constant. A is now known. That's the boundary condition. Minus c1 quantity times uh, exponential of minus p of zero z. It's zero because we've located the boundary layer. Oops, that's not true, is it? No, it's not. This is a typo. This should be what? That's zeta. What's zeta? X naught, yeah. Okay, so in my solution, did I have the right answer? Yeah. Okay, so here, here I have it correct, but other other uh, in in the other location I have it incorrect. So that that should be corrected to X naught. All right. Um, so now this gives us a consistent behavior of the inner solution. It decays away. And we'll show that it actually decays up, decays up to C1, in fact, or, well, some, something like that. Not, not exactly C1. All right. Um, yeah, no, actually C1. Let's see. Yeah, this guy here. Yeah, it's going to decay up to C1 because this is just going to be zero. The thing is, we don't know if A is bigger than B in this case. So we don't know if it's going to decay up or decay down. So I, I do have to be a bit more careful about that. 
it could be a situation like like this or it could be a situation like this okay just depending on whether b or or a is uh, bigger than the other okay so this gives us our exponential decay through the boundary layer now we know that the boundary layer is located at x naught we also know the boundary layer thickness delta is equal to epsilon we know that now we need to use the right boundary condition for the leading order outer problem. So let's start by assuming that the outer solution, y out has the asymptotic expansion up to little o of 1, like that. The uh, derivative is just the derivative of this plus an order 1 term. And the second derivative is the derivative of y naught. Second derivative of y naught plus an order 1 term, all as epsilon goes to 0 usual stuff there the order one outer problem or in other words the leading order outer problem you can check is just equal to this guy okay this one we're not expanding around the terms um you know there's no there's no boundary layer to expand about so we're not going to do an expansion about that we're just going to keep uh generic x terms all right so this is valid uh on an interval x1 to x2 where x1 is just has to be bigger than x0 where that's where the boundary layer is located and now we have this boundary condition y0 of x2 is equal to b that's the right hand boundary condition and the solution of this problem is uh is uh fairly standard you can show that it's just b times an exponential uh integral from x to x naught so this is unknown so this is what gives it still its functional value with respect to x uh p or q of t over p of t and keep in mind that we're not in danger of dividing by zero because we assumed that p is everywhere greater than zero okay if you do get p equals zero somewhere then uh, you have what's called a singular point and you have to um, and do some analysis around that to see whether it's a regular singular point or a irregular singular point. Do you guys remember singular points when you were taking differential equations? Or so usually you don't talk about irregular or regular singular points, and so you until you start uh, taking uh, a second course in ordinary differential equations. It's kind of a it's it's not something that's covered in a first course, you know. The Cauchy problem, it's a different than that. Yeah. Have you has anyone ever seen Aries uh, differential equation? Okay. Well, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, uh, so we're going to introduce an intermediate variable. We do that as usual. W is equal to x minus x naught. x naught is, of course, the location of our boundary layer. And we're going to divide that by a, an intermediate, intermediate scale called eta. And eta is going to zero as epsilon goes to zero, but it doesn't go to zero as fast as delta, right? That's the usual thing. So I like to use our shorthand notation to represent all that. Remember, there's three things that's represented by the shorthand. Now for fixed finite w, we know that um, because we're around the boundary layer, okay, we're expanding about this boundary layer for this intermediate variable, w is going to be a positive number and it's going to be an order one number. All right, so all we have to do is um, for the matching procedure, the usual, usual matching conditions, we write x in terms of the w variable, right? Remember that? And then you do an expansion. It's not hard to show that in this case, um, this is the exact uh, form of this whenever we replace x with x naught plus uh, a to w. And if we do an order one correction, well, all we do is recognize that if we just drop this term, then the difference in the integral is just an order one term, okay? Not hard to show that. Um, so basically what you do is look at the, this is equal to, right? So just the, just the integral part. 
So the integral part x naught plus eta w to x2, what we're going to do is write that as the integral from x naught to x2. And then what do I have to do to do that? So remember, w is positive. So we've got to subtract off the integral from x naught up to x naught plus eta w. But the thing we're integrating is a nice thing. It's a continuous function. So this guy here is going to be small because you're integrating over a small interval. So that's the sort of argument that you would use to show that this is equal to this plus an order one correction. But you're, taking it exponential. you're also taking an exponential, but you have an exponential of a, let's see. So should that be like a, becomes like multiplying a constant? Let me see here, let me see. So, um, uh, so, Um, my, I think my analysis needs to be a little more careful. But if you put your like close parentheses after all small one, then that is where you know, that Yeah, yeah. This is just gives me this, but this is still correct. I think I know what you're saying. Um, so remember, if I do my plus O1 in here, then this is going to be O1 exponential of O1, which is close to one, right? I think that's what you're trying to say. But um, I can show ultimately that this is true. And the way I can do that is to use a Taylor expansion of exponential. All right. Um, I hadn't thought about that. I just blindly copied uh, from another source. But I, I believe that, that that's the argument you can take. So you do it in a couple steps. But this is still, still true. Uh, I, I know that because I read it in several sources, so I believe I believe it. But uh, you know, you do you should you should be intellectually curious and check some details yourself. So I, I should check that. Will I? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Okay. Uh, so um, similarly, we're going to um, now. By the way, we don't have to do this hard expansion technique, we can just do the simplified matching technique, which I'm going to remind you of the simplified te uh, matching technique uh, that we used in chapter one, again, later when we're talking about nonlinear boundary value problems, because I get tired of using the really complicated matching technique all the time. If you're just interested in the leading order composite, the, uh, the n equals zero, m equals zero composite expansion, then you can just use the simple matching procedure, which works as well. All right, now um, we, we're we going to use the more complicated version, but that's okay. So what we do is uh, we replace the Z variable, uh, or we replace Y not Z uh, by something where it's Y not with the Z variable replaced with uh, the W variable. And then we do our usual expansions. So here's the exact expression of this, but notice that this is now going to be a transcendentally small term. So this is another feature of the asymptotic expansion. If we got the sign wrong on this guy, then this would not be transcendentally small anymore. It would be transcendentally large, whatever that means. So it wouldn't decay, it would blow up. So this term is all we get basically because what's left in this transcendentally small term is order epsilon to the r over a to the r. It doesn't matter what scale of eta we choose. This is always going to be uh, order one. Actually, it's uh, it can be order epsilon if you want. It can be order epsilon to any power as long as you fix the scale of, of eta. But all we need is order one. And so this tells us that uh, y0 of z is equal to c1 plus order one term. So now if we try to match, then all we need to do, remember, here's our matching for our outer solution. So there's the leading order piece. And here's the leading order piece. If you just do the simple matching procedure of limits, then you get exactly the same thing. So c1 is equal to b times the exponential of integrals x naught to x2, q over p dt. So that tells you exactly what c1 is. And so this tells us that our matching function is here as usual, right? Usual matching procedure. So that's that's 
um, solves everything because all the, so now you know how to formulate the composite solution. I didn't write it, but uh, how do we do composite solution? So the composite then is gonna be C00, X epsilon is gonna be Y0 of X plus Y, capital Y zero of, let's see, let's see, don't want that. Now we want to write W, okay, so we need to replace now W, no, let's see, we can just do it like this. We, we have Z, right? So this is gonna be X, minus x naught over epsilon. That's all we need there. And then we just subtract off the matching term. But the matching term is just going to be c1, okay? Where c1 is equal to this value. So that's how we construct our composite solution. And that's what you see here in the statement of the, the theorem, the, the result. There's our composite. This is the matching term, inner solution outer solution. And of course, now everything is completely determined. Okay. All right. So that locates the boundary layer for us. All we need to know is, is P positive, right? And if it's P positive, then uh, that's sufficient conditions to know for this uh, simplified setting that our boundary layer is located at X naught. But what if P is negative? Okay. What if P is negative? Uh, Okay, did I assume that? Thought I did. Okay, yeah, all the same. All we're gonna do now is suppose that P is negative for all X in X naught to X two. There's still a boundary layer of thickness epsilon, but now it's located at X two. And the reason is because when you do the inner layer construction, you reason through where it, how can the, the inner let the inner solution produce a decaying solution. And that's only if X uh, zeta is, is located at X two. So the boundary layer is at X two. And now the, uh, the composite expansion, the composite approximation is gonna be Y zero plus Y zero of X minus X two, capital Y zero of X minus X two over epsilon, usual transformation minus the matching term. But now the uh, outer solution looks like this. So here again, if I put, just to check and make sure everything is uh, making sense, if I put X equal to X naught, this integral is zero. And so exponential of zero is just one. So the boundary value now is just gonna be A rather than B. And uh, now notice that, um, uh, here we go. So for this guy, I might have a. Uh, da, 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 da. I think I have a typo here. For this guy here, I believe this should be a plus sign, right? Because I want Z to be negative at the boundary layer, right? So this is a typo because I want asymptotic decay, Z is gonna be negative near the boundary layer located at X equals X two. So that would give me a asymptotic decay as Z becomes more and more negative, which is what I want. And now in this case, um, our matching constant is gonna be given by this integral. Right. Um, I guess I did forget to say, uh, what did I say here? The proof of the error estimate would be taken up later. Actually, um, uh, I'll probably someday write up that result. But right now, I changed my mind and just referenced uh, uh, one of the books that I'm using to prepare the lecture notes. And so uh, I don't actually prove it uh, in the book yet. But if you look at the lecture notes, which I will update soon, 
actually they're updated, but they're on my computer. I haven't updated the ones that are on Canvas. Then it'll give a reference for this for this part. We don't have to do anything. The proof is similar, right? So there's nothing. The the argument similar. There's nothing to do. But I do want to make a remark. This is a typo here. Suppose that Px has a simple zero at an interior point of uh, x naught x two. Let's suppose that uh, zeta is the boundary layer located um, uh, somewhere in the interior. Um, that should be p. p of x is less than zero on one side, and it's greater than zero. What happened to me to that day? I bet, oh, I was probably following a reference where they were using A and B for the coefficients rather than P and Q. Um, so this should be P and P. If P is positive on the other side, it's not too difficult to see that the that zeta is the location of a boundary layer generically. So, and that's because um, I can show I have decay on both sides of the layer. And we're going to, we'll have an example where this happens uh, in, a, in the next uh, set of slides. So we're not going to prove this case, but you could put together a proof, I think, not too, uh, with, without too much difficulty to do this. Okay, so we'll explore this, um, this problem in a, in, a, in a later section, actually, in the next set of slides. So uh, this is uh, still in chapter five, slide deck number two, part two of three. I was trying to fit it onto two slide decks, but it, it doesn't look like it's going to be possible. That's because the section after this one is on nonlinear problems, and that that, sec that section is pretty long. Really interesting, uh, but I couldn't fit it in. You, you can see I had this many... Uh, this much space left to put these little dot, this little pages, and it couldn't fit. So there's more slides than than room right there. I have a quick question. So for the last, like for the thing that we just talked about, like the boundary layers in the middle, can we, for example, pop the problem into two problems, and we actually show that one for positive one and negative already, and then we can just glue them together? You could if you knew what the boundary value was in the middle, right? It would be overdetermined to say what that boundary value is, gotcha. right? That's a good idea. And in fact, we'll see how you glue things together when there's something in the middle. Because the next, uh, well, after this next problem, the three problems after that that we look at, there's going to be a corner layer problem and uh, two nonlinear problems where we look at boundary layers in the middle of the domain they're all going to be of that type where we have to glue. We have we have basically we have an outer solution on one side of a boundary layer, an outer solution on the other, and we have an inner solution in between. And we have to glue them together. In fact, we saw this uh, very early on in chapter one with the uh, the Con Hilliard van der Waals diffuse interface uh, between uh, two uh, two phase domains. So that was a case where we had a boundary layer in the middle of a of a domain. All right, let's jump into this. A linear non-constant coefficient boundary value problem. Everything we've done so far, except for the general theory that we just went through, involve problems where we had constant coefficients. So anything that we've done so far where we've run through uh, things in detail uh, had constant coefficients. This is the first one we're going to tackle and, um, where we're going to try to do a higher order matching, but with non-constant coefficients. So here's the boundary value problem that we want to study. So epsilon y double prime plus one plus x quantity times y prime plus y of x equals zero. And the boundary conditions are y at zero is equal to one and y of one is equal to one as well. 
Now, um, what we're going to try to do in this case is compute two uh, higher order composite expansions, the, the composite uh, approximation YC11 and YC22. Notice that P is equal to, it's not constant anymore. It's a one plus X, but we're on the domain X equals or X between zero and one. So P does not have a zero in that domain. It's, com it's completely positive. So we can expect the boundary layer to be at the left-hand endpoint. Done. Okay, we don't really have to worry about that much more. Uh, what if our domain was a little bit larger? Uh, let's see. So if our domain, uh, so what does P look like? P is one plus X, right? So it's, but if we looked at a domain, maybe somewhere back here, where P cross at this point, uh, or zeta, what is that point, by the way? That's uh, minus one, right? Then we would expect to have a boundary layer back there at minus one. In fact, we would expect to have a boundary layer at both sides of that, or, you know, we, we would, act, if, our, if our domain was something like this, then we would expect a boundary layer in the middle of the domain or somewhere in the middle. But uh, that's a that's a problem for another time. Here we're safe. P is uh, everywhere positive on the interval of interest, and so we have a boundary layer at the left hand endpoint, if a boundary layer exists at all. Now, again, epsilon is a positive number, but it's a small parameter, and it's getting smaller and smaller. That justifies our assumption that we can make these asymptotic expansions because this parameter epsilon is getting smaller and smaller. It's a singular perturbation because if we set epsilon to be zero, we'd lose an order uh, for our differential equation. We'd have a first order equation, which would have two boundary conditions and a first order equation. Well, the solution to a first order equation cannot satisfy both boundary conditions generically. It, you could luck out and have it satisfied two boundary conditions, but generically, you would have no solution. All right, now using our, I'm going to skip uh, ahead a little bit because these really are our usual techniques. We have an inner problem, we have an outer problem, right? And uh, we solve it, um, we solve it recursively. And we find that y0 is 2 over 1 plus x. y1 for the outer expansion is 2 over 1 plus x quantity cubed minus 1 over 2 times quantity 1 plus x times epsilon because this is y0 plus y1 times epsilon. The y2 term gets multiplied by epsilon squared as usual. And so there's the y2 term. Now, because you, you might wonder, why do I, how do I know that my expansion should be a power series in terms of epsilon? That's because everything is kind of well behaved in this. So one thing our, our uh, analysis didn't tell us is what should be the asymptotic power series expansions of the inner and outer problem or inner and outer solutions. And as long as P is positive, uh, then, uh, and everything else is otherwise nice, then we can use the usual standard integral power series uh, uh, asymptotic expansions in terms, well, we can use the usual asymptotic series in terms of integral powers of epsilon. That's the better way to say it. So here is y0, y1, and y2. This ex expansion is valid for uh, x in the interval x1 to 1, where x1 is just some number bigger than 0 and less than 1. We don't really need to care too much about what it is. Meanwhile, the inner expansion, which is written in terms of the stretch variable, remember our boundary layer is at x equals zero. So whenever we do our transformation into the stretch variable, we do x minus x zero, but here x zero is equal to zero. So this gives us z minus, or z is equal to x over epsilon. So it satisfies these terms. Okay, so we get a bunch of things which look nice because why? They're 
decaying exponentially as Z uh, becomes more and more positive. So every term gives the, or has the right, possesses the right sign. So exponential decay, exponential decay, exponential decay. So this is capital Y, I guess all of this is capital Y sub zero, capital Y sub one, and all this is capital Y sub two. So we've expanded up to second order. Leading order, first order correction, second order correction. Okay, so this is asymptot asymptotic expansion as epsilon goes to zero for all Z in this range where Z is just some positive number. And we do this by um, using the boundary condition at the left-hand side. Remember, there's one boundary condition at the left-hand side, and therefore we're going to be left with a bunch of unknown coefficients. If we go up to the second order correction, then we're going to have three unknown coefficients that have to be nailed down, C0, C1, and C2. Notice that with the outer solution, all of the unknown coefficients were nailed down through the boundary condition. And so now there are no unknown co coefficients remaining. Everything here is known. Any questions about that? Okay. So now uh, we go through their usual process. Okay. So I'm, I do this so that you get so used to it that, you know, it's no big deal anymore. I'll keep reminding you until it's just boring. So we introduce an intermediate variable. Remember, the general definition is going to be x minus x naught over eta, but x naught is equal to zero. The location, or in this in this case, the location of the boundary layer is at x naught, x naught zero. So there's there's our intermediate variable w. Eta is called the intermediate scale, and delta is the um, is the other scale. All right. Um, now we know that delta is equal to epsilon in this case, so I think I might have forgotten to say that. Uh, here's the stretch variable, so it's implicit in that, but I don't think I said it anywhere else. How do we know that um, that delta equals epsilon is the right scale? Well, we just follow that little proposition that we had earlier. Since P is positive and everything else is nice, we know that delta is equal to epsilon. So that's why we get a delta equals epsilon appearing on the top there. All right, so W, or sorry, eta must satisfy these properties. It's greater than zero, but it goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. But delta, this is delta now, delta is equal to epsilon, uh, goes to zero faster. So delta over eta uh, goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. And that's all represented by this shorthand. I'm just putting everything in there. All right. Uh, now, um, we're going to do our usual matching sort of attempt. Uh, suppose that n is equal to m. That's going to be the case. This is the nice case because um, everything, um, when p is positive, then we can do uh, asymptotic expansions uh, for both the inner and outer problem as a power series and integral powers of epsilon. And therefore, we can always expect in that case to match with n and m both equal to each other. So for n and m equal to each other and phi equal to epsilon to the k. So this is the, this is the um, asymptotic sequence used in the inner expansion. Um, and so in this case, I said, as I said, the... Uh, power series expansion that we use in the inner and outer can just be used in integral powers of epsilon. So that's why we take phi k to be equal to epsilon k. But if you need to refresh why why are we using or what does this phi k notation mean, that goes back to chapter two in case you're interested. All right, so uh, then we do uh, an expansion of our outer solution up to order n. Remember, n is not nailed down. We're just saying n and m are equal to each other. 
we replace X with the variable W and we do that expansion and we keep all terms which are larger than little o of epsilon to the n. And this is our wastebasket for all the rest of the terms, which are smaller than these. Likewise, for the, um, for the inner solution, we take our inner solution up to order n, our expansion up to order n. We replace the x or the z variable with the w variable, and we expand, and we only keep all those terms which are larger than little o of epsilon to the n, same as up here. So these are our two matching functions, and we want those to match exactly, right? We want them to match, and when they match, that gives us our matching function. We drop the in and out. And then our composite solution to order n, n is the outer expansion up to order n, plus the inner expansion up to order n, everything gets reverted back to writing in terms of the variable x. I guess here I should have said, we already know that delta is equal to epsilon, so I probably should say that this is just epsilon. But we double count. Remember, we double count because there's some parts of the inner solution which are represented in the outer solution, so we have to subtract those off. And we have to write those again replacing w with a with a variable in terms of x so that we have everything finally in terms of x. Well, then we expect that the difference between the true solution and this composite solution up to order n is big O of epsilon to n plus one. And so this case, I really do want to say what the size of the error is. It's what it gets. Um, so basically, this term captures everything in the true solution up to order epsilon to the n, capital N. And what's lost is things which are big O of epsilon n plus one, the next order up. And by the way, this is uniform on zero to one. That means this is a uniform asymptotic statement. It holds for all x. All right, any questions before we jump into the particulars of this case? So this got long. So I split it into two examples. In the first example, we're going to get the one, one match. N equals one, M equals one. And then the second example, it's the same as the first, but we're going to get N equals two and M equals two. And we can actually do a match in that case. The smart money is to do the expansion of the inner function first, because that tells you how many terms of the outer function the outer solution you're going to need when you do its matching, when you compute its matching function. That will help you determine what the scale of eta, what scale of eta you need. All right, so let's do this. Uh, here's the expansion up to order one. It's this awful looking mess. Okay, not too bad, not too awful, but it's a mess. What do we do? Well, everywhere we see Z, we're going to replace that with um, minus W, no, sorry, everywhere we see Z, we're going to replace with W eta over epsilon. Z is equal to W eta over epsilon. Right? Did I say that somewhere? And you can, yeah, you can reverse engineer it from this equation here. So Z is equal to W eta over epsilon. Just do that replacement. You see nice things happening. And of course, this has to, this kind of has to happen. We want these terms to be exponentially decaying. In fact, they're transcendentally small. So this term is transcendentally small, as is this one, as is this one. So everywhere I see transcendentally small term, I'm going to replace with O, uh, little o of epsilon to the r over eta to the r. We do have some terms which survive. So this term, which was z, now becomes, my, well, minus z becomes minus w eta over epsilon. What other term survives? Uh, this term is going to survive as well. This term doesn't quite make it. And this term doesn't make it. But this term does, c, c1. 
All right, so just replacing all of those uh, transcendentally small terms with th these terms, this is what I get. And now on the next page, I'll get rid of those in favor of, you know, um, an or little o of epsilon to some power, a little o of epsilon squared, actually. No, just epsilon. All right, so what terms survive? I claim just this one, one minus C naught plus C naught minus one quantity times W eta minus C one times epsilon, and everything else is gonna be an order epsilon term. Question. Okay. Writing the Enoch extension and then the other Writing the, oh, yeah. Ring, yeah. Thank you. Writing the inner expansion in the intermediate variable. Oh, I also made that type of thing. <laughs> I think it's a standard type of thing. Oh, that must be an actual English word because I, my spell checker didn't ring. Yeah, I guess it is. Like ringing or rang. Is that how you spell it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, are these three terms the right ones, right? I claim that these three terms are the, well, no, four terms, right? One, two, three, four. So let's go back and see that those survive. So here's the one, C0 gets multiplied. This is going to be small, so I'm going to neglect that. But I get this minus one, so minus C0 survives. What about this term here? Well, this gets multiplied by epsilon, so W eta survives. There's a W eta. But I also have a C0 W eta, which survives. Okay? The epsilon goes away because of this cancellation there. And then finally, I have a C1 that survives. So that accounts for all the terms that you see there. Everything else can be reckoned as little o of epsilon. So um, why is that true? Well, that's because, well, if epsilon hits this guy, that's the little, little o of epsilon. Uh, same with this one. Let's see. This one you might want wonder about, right? This one, I multiply epsilon. So I'll keep that one. So what about this one? Could that possibly blow up and harm me? Well, yeah, it could get large, right? Eta squared over epsilon squared. Which direction does that go as epsilon goes to zero? That gets large, right? Luckily, I have an exponentially or transcendentally small term, which kills it. So what you've got here is a situation where you have eta squared over epsilon squared little o of epsilon to the r over eta to the r. So ultimately, you can rewrite this as little o of epsilon to the r minus 2, eta to the r minus 2, but I can take r to be any number, right? So basically, that is in the same boat. Transcendentally small rapidly wipes out any algebraically growing term. Yes. R equals three. Uh, R equals three might not quite get it for you because you don't yet know what eta should be. Once you fix the eta scale, then you're set. But you know that eta is between. But we know that epsilon divided by eta goes to zero. Away. True, right? But the point is, uh, gosh, son of a nutcracker. Okay. Yeah, there we go. All right, but it's the usual sort of thing. So remember, ep, uh, eta is going to be something like epsilon to some power, and alpha is going to be less than one, right? Greater than zero. So basically, you're looking at... Um, what is epsilon over eta? Well, that's going to be epsilon to the one minus alpha. And now you're going to raise all that to r power. So eventually that r times this small number, 
this is some fraction, right? Eventually, R times that fraction is going to get larger than one. It has to, okay? Because R is a, an integer of any, well, it's any positive number that you want. Eventually, that the power epsilon, eventually, uh, what we need is R times one minus alpha to eventually be greater than one. When that, as soon as that happens, then you know that's a order of epsilon term, little o epsilon term. Okay. Everybody cool about that? Okay. Well, so now that fixes our inner expansion. That tells us that I need these terms to appear in my outer expansion. Otherwise, my there's no hope for a match. Okay, so here's my matching function for the inner part. So now this gives me a target to shoot at with my outer uh, solution expansion. So that's why I like to do this one secondly if if I'm doing things uh, in a sort of proper logical order. Now, you can do everything in the Gauss style and remove the scaffolding and do it in whatever order you want. Okay, But uh, when you're trying to... Uh, show how things are going in a pedagogically uh, logical fashion, you should probably do it in the logical order. Now, in the outer uh, solution expansion, we're going to keep uh, leading order and first order terms. And so there's our expansion up to first order. Now, what we do is replace uh, x with the, the w variable. We're going to do that momentarily. But I need to know what are these expansions. So I'm going to use the binomial expansions to get those. So as long as eta is small enough, then W eta is going to be small. And so I have these binomial expansions. Okay. So you can treat this as a power one, or in other words, think about this as a one plus W eta to the minus one power, right? That's why it's called a binomial expansion because it looks a lot like the usual binomial expansion where you have, let's say, three here. As long as the carries just a two. That's true. That is true. Um, this one is not white, but uh, similar, right? And then, of course, we're going to have to take a fifth power as well. So that's why I'm calling it binomial expansions. But yeah, that's a ge geometric series. You're quite right. All right, so for this cubic, what do we get? One of the cubic, we get one minus three w eta plus six w squared eta squared. And uh, I'm collecting the final terms. So Calvin, I'm following your suggestion using big O for, from time to time, because we can. Um, the reason why I use little o when we're doing matching is because it, it contains a lot of crazy terms. And I don't know if they're big O or something, but I do not do know concretely that they're going to be little o. Yeah, uh, or you can write big O, instead of big O, epsilon, you write big O of Or you can write big O of the uh, smallest power, but uh, I think. But uh, little O works better, I think, in this case. All right, so this is the painful part. I've taken away all the pain for you because I did all these calculations and I did them all by hand. I promise, I really spent like my early part of January doing this by hand. So you replace the X variable with um, with W eta. So there's our new problem. But now this is not helpful for expansion or for matching. I want to expand these variables now. So I get a power series in terms of powers of epsilon, powers of eta, and combinations of the two, epsilon and eta. Okay, so that's that's the target. All right, so I have uh, two uh, simple um, geometric series, I guess. We collect those together. You get two minus epsilon over two because of this term here. And there's that expansion for this. And then what else do I have? I have the cubic. Okay, they're one over the cubic. So I have two epsilon, that's the prefactor coming from here and here. And then one over one plus W eta cubed, that just gives me that power series expansion in terms of eta. All right, now, uh, what do I want to keep? 
well, I know I should only keep so much, right? I know I need to keep terms which are present in this guy. So what terms, now you don't have to worry about the exact number of terms it appears because it's like, well, do I count that as one term or what? So really it's a three term thing. So this is order one. So I need to have order one present. Well, actually, if I don't have order one present, that's okay too, because it's just saying order one is just zero. That's the match. But now I do need to have a, an order eta present and I need to have an order epsilon present. So that's my, that's my um, what, what I'm concentrating on, having order one, order eta, and order epsilon. And I'll finish in a minute here. All right, so what I do is I'm gonna throw away any term which is smaller than order epsilon. Is that right? Uh, yeah, smaller than order epsilon. And what I get is two minus two w eta. So there's my eta term. Two minus one half times epsilon. So there's my epsilon term. That gives me all three terms which appeared in um, my inner solution expansion. Now I had to make a choice at some point because the choice I had to make was I had to decide to get rid of this term right here. So that's the guy that I had to decide to get rid of. So I want this term here to be order um, order little o of epsilon. So how do I know that that's going to be little, little o of epsilon? Well, I'm going to force it to be little o of epsilon. That means if I divide by epsilon, that term is going to go to zero. And if that happens, this guy is not going to appear. And this guy is already not going to appear because it's getting multiplied by epsilon anyway. Okay, so we're safe on that. One. It's just this guy, when it multiplies by that too, that's the one that I'm interested in getting rid of. Well, that's going to set my eta scale for me. Okay, no, but no problem. I'm allowed to choose my eta scale as long as I can choose it to be small enough or large enough, whatever, so that certain things happen. So that sets the width of my matching scale. When I do that choice, uh, you can figure out what eta, what power of epsilon eta should be in order to make that all work. But in any case, I find my, my outer solution matching function is this, and then I can match terms. So if you go back and look at what the inner solution matching function was, now I'm just gonna match the order one, order eta and order epsilon terms. If you do that, then you get these three equations. So you get some interesting information from the order one term, namely C zero is equal to minus one. You get nothing new by matching the order eta term. You still get C zero um, equals minus one. Okay, I'm not sure. Right, so uh, that's going to be minus 2w equals minus 2w. So you just get a consistent equation. So that's what I just label consistent. Okay, no new information. Order epsilon, you do get new information. You, you nail down your C1 parameter as minus 3 halves. That tells you that your match function has to be this, which, by the way, is always the match function for the outer solution. Basically, that's what you're you're nailing down. And now I know how to uh, do my composite solution. I just do the expansion for the outer problem up to first order. Same with the inner, writing everything in terms of x variable, and I subtract off the matching function. If I do that, then here's my composite approximation. All right. So. Now, uh, the next example goes through computing the 2-2 composite solution, but I don't want to leave you hanging uh, before showing you a nice picture because I don't think we've had any pictures yet today. So there's the 1-1 composite solution for epsilon set equal to 0 0.1. The blue is the true solution. So you can see uh, the yellow solution and the blue solution are kind of a ways off from each other. As epsilon gets smaller and smaller, they converge because the diff their difference is order epsilon, right? But now the 2-2 solution, which we're going to construct next time, the, the beginning of class, that does way better. That's the green solution. And for those of you who aren't colorblind and can see there, the green solution is lying in between the yellow and the blue. So it's doing a much better job, okay? much closer to the true solution. Eric, the true solution to the Yeah. 
So this ODE has a true solution. Actually, um, okay, so I need to confess. It's a true solution, but it's a numerically computed one. So let's say a true solution in the sense that it has a unique solution. Okay. It exists and is unique, but I computed this one by um, a high order numerical solution. Yeah, well, yeah. You have one for successful coefficient. That is impressive. You have an explicit formula for that. Right. Right. Uh, it's not too hard to do a power series expansion to get the solution in this case, uh, because it's a regular non-constant coefficient problem. All right. Um, see you guys on Thursday. Thanks for giving me some extra time. I promise I'll give it back to you someday. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'll tell you what. I'll give you that for free. You can have my extra five minutes of a lecture for free. You don't have to pay me extra. Any questions uh, online or or in person? Okay, I'll see you next time. <laughs>